Welcome, folks, to another episode of the Lessons from the Cockpit Show. I am your host, Mark Hassera. And for over 60 years, my passion has been everything military and aviation. On the Lessons from the Cockpit Show, we interview some of the most fascinating and incredible pilots, aircrew members, maintainers, and aviation enthusiasts from all over the world. We want to hear the stories, but more importantly, what did they learn from these extreme and extraordinary military, commercial, and even general aviation events in their lives? Our purpose is to show how does the aviation world work and increase critical thinking skills both in the air and on the ground. Many of the stories you're going to hear on the Lesson from the Cockpit show have never been told before. And today's one of those days where we have on a very special guest in episode two, talking with Bo Smith, Navy A4A7 pilot. He was a naval aviator during the Vietnam War, and he helped invent some of the tactics, techniques, and procedures used to hunt the surface-to-air missile sites and anti-aircraft defenses in Vietnam. He's also going to tell us about some of the other targets that they went after, like the Thanh Hoa Bridge, nicknamed the Dragon's Jaw. This episode of the Lessons from the Cockpit show is sponsored financially by Wall Pilot, custom aviation art for the walls of your home, office, or hangar. These are four, six, and eight foot, very detailed profiles of famous aircraft printed on vinyl that you can peel off and stick to any flat surface. There's 143 ready to print, and we can also do custom work of your favorite plane with your name, tail number, and even your favorite weapons load on the aircraft. So go by wallpilot.com and take a look at some of these ready to print or order a custom print from wallpilot.com. So grab an adult beverage of your choice, sit down, strap in, and let's begin the Lessons from the Cockpit show Episode two with Navy Captain Bo Smith, A4 and A7 pilot extraordinaire as he talks about flying Iron Hand missions and other targets over North Vietnam. Yeah. And, and maybe that's something you can explain to the audience here, okay? What is Iron Hand and why is it so important? Okay, Iron Hand is the Navy's term for anti-SAM warfare where the Air Force uh, mission is called a wild, will, wild weasel mission. In the Air Force, it's flown in the 105, a 2C 105. I don't know if they had F4 wild weasels, but they certainly had them. Toward the end. Toward the end, they, they did. did. They had some F4 wild weasels. But you have a radar operator, EW operator, in an airplane, and it's a two-seat airplane in the 1967 area, 1970s, two-seat. In the Navy... The Iron Hand mission was flown in single seat A4s and A7s, and you, the single seat pilot had to be trained in all this identifying radars by their PRFs. And the same things that the EW operator in the Wild Weasel had to do, the Navy was doing it with one pilot. You know, it did, and, and your mission, you were armed with a Shrike missile, anti-radiation missile, mm -hmm. and some other either a rocket like the Zuni rocket or in 72, we had the rock eyes so that you could follow up um, AGM 45 strike with actually attacking the site itself. One air, well, actually two airplanes because you're always flying in sections and right on top of the SAM site. You got used to literally my concept and my tactics for the 67 was to get well out in front and just be up there at 18,000 feet, be confident that they would not commit MiGs or SAMs yeah. to a section when they had 80 airplanes coming, you know, or 60 airplanes. <laughs> yeah. they, they were going to wait, you know, I didn't, and we never got engaged. I never got engaged directly by that SAM site. Now, if I had flown those tactics in 62, they would have ZSU-23 me. They couldn't do it in 72. But in 67, yeah. we got right on top of them. And I've had two occasions, one in 72, and I talk about it in my memoir, and one in 67 where, where I did a down-the-throat strike shot at a SAM launched, and the and the guy who was the commander in the fan song shut off the fan song and detonated the missile right over the site. <laughs> uh -huh. so, 
Boom. Uh, I, I saw it happen twice. You say, boy, this is really cool. Because you know that that SAM can't, it can't fly against, you know, trying to prevent it from going yeah. to the strike route. And any way you could do it was fine for the same idea. If they could shoot a SAM up there and make you have to avoid it and not mm -hmm. get to the target, they were sex successful whether they shot you down or not. Yeah. There weren't that many airplanes shot down with SAMs. Most of the airplanes were shot down by guns. 37, 37 millimeter yeah. in the target area at four and 5,000 feet. So it's, yeah. uh, it was, that's where the danger was. But anyway, so Iron Hand missions, you're sitting there and you're kind of dueling with the air defense commander and what, what's he, what he's going to do. And the guy that was at Vin was really good. That guy learned to shoot the fan song to basically shoot on spoon rest. And, you know, he would get the target and he would go ahead and launch the missile, missile and then come up with fan song. So there uh, wouldn't be much fan song. He didn't use the fan song for the acquisition phase. He used spoon rest, not, not even fire gun. Uh, he got really good shots. He had very good shooting out of that. He was shooting off the top of a building at, at Vin. Uh, Lee Cole, who we lost in June 28th, I guess it was, 1967, was there at Vin. You know, and you would think, oh, Vin, no big deal. He was very good. That's uh, interesting. He, I had never heard that, Bo. Yeah. So he, he's he, firing. He is firing on his long-range looking radar, yeah. saying, okay, here they come. They're out here. Launches yeah. the missile and then turns the fan song on, which is the target tracking Radar. Yeah, he, yeah, he has to track with it. In your headsets, you're hearing spoon rest yeah. and not knowing, and then you don't hear. You hear the APR-27 to say there's a missile in the air. You say, how can that be? Well, that's because, but he probably uses some fire, flap wheel, fire yeah. wheel, conical sand yeah. to get the altitude. Yeah. You know, he's getting that missile up, but he can't do anything with it. It's It's dead. Until yeah. the fan song comes on. So it's a tricky maneuver. They also learned the Russians came in and did a lot of people don't know this, but when we had the bombing halt, the Russians came and did a whole lot of training with their, their, their SA2 commanders. This is a 68, 69 time frame. Yeah. And so they were a lot better in 72 than they were in 67. They had gotten all this training. It was interesting in Rolling Thunder, you are not allowed to bomb SAM site because they thought there were Russians there. They didn't want to kill Russians. Well, screw that. What, what a <laughs> stupid idea that is. You know, the Russians are taking their chances. They're down in a war zone. Uh, we didn't attack airfields. You know, it was just, you couldn't Crazy attack. restrictions. Like, of course, you had the, the, the circles around Hanoi and Haiphong. You couldn't row recce in those. Yeah. You couldn't hit. Of course, you never were allowed to bomb the dikes or something. You don't want to wipe out the economy of the country. You want to be able to do something. But I don't know anybody that bombed a dike. Now I know some, I'm a, I know someone that uh, did a CBU on a Russian ship in Haiphong Harbor. He's a 105 pilot. But Jack Broughton talks about that in his book. Yeah, yeah, that that was Ted Tolman, and he came out there and he gave color gun camera film to the wing commander. He said, "Okay, this I did it. You know, this yeah. is it." I, I dropped the CPU. And he had, and Tolman had good reason for doing it, too. Yeah. They're shooting at him. So he did it. Uh, and the wing commander trashed the film or something. And when it came out, he's yeah. the guy that took, took the hits for it, not Ted Tolman. Yeah. He was a great, he's a great, Ted Tolman was a great guy. If you are going to pick somebody that you're going to have as your, 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 your major that you're going to fly on as a Navy lieutenant, Ted Tolman or Sam Martin were the, were the people you want to fly with. I had a really good time flying with another guy named George Bogert, who ended up going in the Air National Guard. George and I flew a night flight, and I did a f night formation landing in the 105, and Harry Scher Watts observed it. And, uh, you know, we got yelled at for doing it, but at the same time, it was kind of a wink from sure that it was a really good night formation. <laughs> uh, Joe Dillon was the DO in the 4519th, and he had flown the F-4 on the four-stall exchange. So yeah. when I came in there, if a student was having problems landing the 105, I got him, not Ted Tolman. Because yeah. Ted Tolman, he could land grease that 105 on, but he couldn't necessarily tell a T-38 uh, first lieutenant how to do it. 
<laughs> and I always, I just took air. I took air airspeed off. Yeah. There was a tape. There was an angle attack tape, yeah. and just have them land with a little bit of power. And once they learned how to do that, because that's how you do formation landings anyway. Once they learned how to control, because we had students, T thirty eight students, disappearing over the hill in the round yeah. Once yeah. they learned, then they could gradually put more speed on, more speed, yeah. and they learned because it was just an eyeball thing. It's very mm-hmm. hard to do that. When you get a Navy type approach where it's all angle of attack and lineup, you just maintain that attitude. You just, in, you know, in a T 38 or the 105, you have to cushion it a little bit because you can't go praying it on there with it. But you can control the airplane that way. And you feel like you're in charge. You're not uh, just drifting along. Uh, I got all, I got the landing cases and it worked pretty well. Yeah. You can tell I'm, I'm talking about all this 105 time whilst I were as a Navy pilot, but it was good. My Ray Thomas, who was a very talented uh, lieutenant who was, did the pocket money, the mining planning mm-hmm. and all that, uh, what did he do? After there, he went to A7Ds in the Air Force, uh-huh. following my kind of career pattern. Because I, I was able to go, for the first 15 years of my career, I was flying the whole time. You know, stayed away from Washington. Yeah. <laughs> But anyway, I, I don't know how – I've never been – never got on the Northeast Railroad from Hanoi. And I did come in from the West, though. It was a little target. And Possum Terrell, who was a SPAD pilot, he could dr nav. Nobody yeah. dr navs anymore. Uh-huh. And he, he could have across Route Pack 2, all up around, and we rolled right in on the target northwest of Hanoi. Amazing. All dr you know, uh, I would try and cheat because there were tack ends along there. I was trying to keep track of where they were. No, those those bad pilots, they could they could DR navigate. That's the A one Sky Raider, really, isn't it? And you know what? That's a big airplane. I, I, the- so is a one oh five weasel. We've got uh, tail number four four zero F one oh five wild weasel G model that's at the museum up here at Hill Air Force Base. One of the cool things they do here, Bo, is they have what's called open cockpit day. And I was there one day when they had the wild weasel. Both cockpits were open in the uh, 105 weasel. You get to see the front seat. You know, and the front seat of the weasel was pretty much the same, but the back had all of the displays, all of the stuff, you know, for figuring out to the, where the electronic warfare officers figure that, everything out. Yeah. And again, you know, the beeps and squeaks you hear in the headset and everything. Yeah. Uh, an amazing stuff. So, hey, you mentioned a mission where you're getting shot at and... A MIG. You said it was one of your DFC missions. Why don't you talk about that real quick? Well, or take as long as you want. Take as long we as you were, want. Because we, this we was were scared, we were scheduled to fly with Mark 36 destructors. And a Mark 36 destructor is a B 50. Well, you could get a thousand pound destructor, I think, but these were 500 pound bombs that had a, instead of having a fuse in it, it had this proximity device. This, it was it was delivered with snake eye fins so that it slowed down and didn't destruct when it hit. And it would go in the mud where a bridge was down. If a repair person came with even the nails in boots, but if these people were barefoot, but if they had a, a metal tool, when it got to the closest area, it went off. So they when you use destructors, when bridges were down, they were to, to make it difficult to repair the bridge. This was a big strike. There was iron hands and flak suppressors. Some reason I was flying the last section destructor guys, mm-hmm. and I was flying with a guy Steve Smith who I'd never flown with before. He wasn't he wasn't one of the ten guys. So I told Steve, "Okay, we're rolling. We're the tail end, Charlie, and we're going to pull off different from everybody else." You know. Even if everybody pulls the right, this is high, high Duong, which is halfway between Haiphong and Hanoi. If you pull off to the left, you're pulling toward Hanoi, which is not great to do that. Yeah. So anyway, I must have been too low because uh, I felt getting hit. And I, I didn't, I think I got hit with some kind of big machine gun, whatever it was. Uh, right away, the fire warning light came on. So, But the engine was running fine. So I didn't worry about it. I pull, I pull off a target, and I told Steve Smith he he didn't lose me, but he was pretty far away. 
I'm going pretty fast, right? I mean, I'm going six <laughs> knots, and, yeah. and this is an A A four, but I'm moving. His his job to keep up with me. I'm not pulling the power back for him. He's a mile back, so I told him, "Okay, uh, engine's running fine." He tells me, "You're trailing the smoke here on fire." I said, "Well." Then I said, "The fire warning light went out." It did. It went out, but it burned through. Is what happened to the system. I'm hauling ass. And I'm over the Keenan airfield, and I'm at about four or 5,000 feet, and I'm going close to 600 knots. Coming opposed to me at 3,000 feet were two MiG-17s. And one was silver, and one was camouflaged. The silver one was probably a Russian in a Russian airplane. Yeah. And with a North Vietnamese pilot. Okay, but there was no way at Keenan they could engage me. I mean, I'm heading to the water at 600 knots, wow. they're coming the opposite direction. By the time they turn, and I'm over, by the time they turn, I'm over the water. So they're not doing it. Then I see their aftermarket light, and they're going after the wingman. He's a mile behind wow. me. So I have no choice but to engage. So I turn around, and I engage the make 17s But we went around a couple of times, and I don't know where Steve Smith was off somewhere, but it the fight... I tried to get the fight to keep going southeast because they, they weren't going to feel very comfortable. So pretty soon we got southeast of Keenan. He could they could see the water. Bugging. So no nobody shot at anybody. On that particular flight, it's written up as 18 MiGs against 24 A4s because <laughs> it turns out there were all kinds of engagements. The the ADIS guy is calling out these all these MiGs. Nobody yeah. sees them. Bar captain, get to him. RF-8s never saw him. One of the engagements was four, four MiG-17s against the four flak suppressors in VA-34 that had Zuni rockets. And it turns out the MiGs overshot them, and the A-4s were able to shoot Zunis at these MiG-17s. They got no hits. Then the A-4 guys, they end up with a Zuni pod. It's like a barn door. So they have to to jettison the Zuni pods mm -hmm. and hope they don't hit the tail, you know, to get the hell out yeah. of there. There are there are like three or four engagements going on, and mine is is just a 2v2. But it made some Air Force book with it had the Charlie from Peanuts in there. There was yeah. this Air Force organization of people that had had MiG engagements. We got in that, we got in that yeah. book. But, you know, the Intrepid in 66, though, had the famous – four MiG 17s against four spats. And they got the MiG 17s. There was one confirmed, one yep. probable, one possible out of four MiGs, three against of them. Against a prop driven airplane. Against, yeah, but because they overshot. And if you overshoot a SPAD, the SPAD's got all those World War II forward firing guns on yeah. and rockets. And it just blew them away. I mean, yeah. it was just, so I wrote, I wrote that up in my, um, in my memoir, but it, there's a real good website with all those guys. And it is. Your website is fantastic. One of those guys from that MIG uh, group that shot yeah. uh, was in Val 4 and the OV 10s. And he got killed with a single bullet through the OV 10 cockpit flying with Val 4. And that's written up in the, okay, that's the flying, flying black oh. ponies. Yeah. This is a great book. This is like McHale's Navy. And uh, Admiral Zumwalt set this up because the Navy was operating riverine forces. This is like 68, 70. Mm -hmm. The Navy is operating the riverine forces, and they had helos, uh, down, which was fine. Uh, Admiral Zumwalt borrowed 25 OV-10s from the Marines and set up this squadron and this book's all about and the guy who was in VA-82 in 1972, Charlie Sapp, was a plank owner in this squadron. He knew more about fast mover facts. And I talk about how bad we we didn't take advantage of his knowledge at all. This book is is very interesting, not just the mission. Uh, I mean, not only did they help the ravine guys, they did all kinds of seal extractions in Cambodia and all kinds of stuff. Uh, very interesting. The other book I have here that is a must-read book is this Once a Warrior King written by David Donovan. Now, David Donovan, I know, and he's a South Georgia guy. That's not his – this is his – he wrote another book about living in South Georgia. This is about Mac V, 
These guys, that teams of five, a captain, a first lieutenant, and three uh-huh. NCO weapons guys, or two we- weapons guys and a medic. Uh-huh. Well, they, would, they would go and they'd work with the mayor of a town, and they would train the, train the South Vietnamese to oppose the North Vietnamese or with five guys. Five guys. Amazing. And they did it, you know, and they were considered, when they say uh, warrior king, is because the mayor considered that captain because the captain had so much power at his disposal. Great book. I, I have tried to get to learn more about the ground side, you know, on the, the, the potential receivers uh-huh. of close air support. So we had that line period of, of close air support in the Delta of course, the uh, Val Four hadn't been set up yet. Val Four mm-hmm. wasn't set up till '68, so this was they weren't there. But we were. I mean, we were a really good close air support platform because we were such good bombers, and we had two Spad squadrons, two Spad squadrons. We could carry more ordnance off that deck on the Intrepid oh. than any carrier because we didn't have any fighters. We had a deck full of attack airplanes. We had. Uh. Two SPAD squadrons and two A4 squadrons. That's all on that Dixie Station carrier. And the SPAD A1 Sky Raider has a lot of hard points to carry weapons on it. A yeah. lot of stuff. And carry heavy bombs like 750s. And the, yeah. I mean, I've seen pictures of them carrying 750-pound bombs, 500-pound bombs, rocket pods, all kinds of things on those airplanes. We, had, course- we, had, we had a bomb load on the A4 where we had a 2,000 pound bomb on the center line and two 1,000 pound bombs on each wing. Oh, we had my God. 4,000 pounds of bombs in an airplane that weighed 10,000 pounds and had fuel of 5,400 pounds. That's, that's all you could, if you didn't have a fuel tank, you had 5,400 pounds of fuel. But you're rolling in on the target and you're dropping 4,000 pounds of bombs off your airplane. That airplane, when it was clean. So no turrets, yeah. no murders. It's that all was a clean A4. You were smoking coming off of there. <laughs> you know, we came back to the carry with only a thousand pounds of fuel on those missions. Those were point sevens carrying four thousand pounds of bombs off of an A4. And see, that's amazing because you mentioned just a little bit ago, you know, during your mission where you're doing that seed mission, devastator mission. You're going 600 knots in an A4, and that's a non-afterburning engine. I mean, that's hauling. It's such that's a clean little long. airplane. You know, of course, it's not a very big airplane either, but I didn't know it only, you know, the only thing weighed only 10,000 pounds. I mean, that's just, holy The smoke, maximum man. gross weight for an A4 and a cat was 24,000 pounds. Mm-hmm. And we got close to that with a tanker configuration because yeah. you could get a 3,000-pound tank. And when you got a 3,000 pound tank on the center line and the buddy stores, you're actually a little bit yeah. over. That's not a fun catch shot. <laughs> if you over rotate, you go in the water. If you under rotate, you go in the water. And the only chance you have is clean it all off, jettison yeah. everything. And that happened several times. It all off. Enough of this yeah. 3,000 pound tank stuff. It wasn't worth it. Normally, we had a center line tank, so you had 7,400 pounds. Then we had our two tours. We would just carry, you know, four bombs or we went through the, the bombing where, the, where we were running out of bombs, where we only, we'd go over the beach with hmm. two 82s and an 81. And that was more. I know yeah. there was one, some, some carriers that flew with one bomb because they were going to keep the sorties count up. They didn't have enough ordnance. That's something I've read about too, Bo, was, and people today would, they go like, what? A bomb shortage. We actually, the United States actually went through a bomb shortage. And it wasn't just the Navy that was having a problem. It was everybody having a problem. We didn't have enough bombs. And most of the bombs, you know, had like 1944, 45 stenciled on them, you know? We had, we had one good bomb that we had from World War II was a 220 pound ring Frank bomb where the casing was cut in rings. Great anti-personnel bomb. And it weighed, you know, it didn't weigh 250 pounds. It weighed like 225. 220. I've never heard of that. Yeah, you know, 220 ring frag bomb. Then we had the M17, which is a big sucker, yeah. non-thermally coated. And we carry those on the A7. We just were running, we just didn't have enough bombs. Uh, I remember, you know, when, when 
President Trump said, you know, if he had been John McCain, he would, would have refused to fly. Well, fine, they just would have sent him back to States or the CEO of the carrier refused uh, to fly them. You know, they just relieve them. That's uh, a stupid comment. We all carried non-thermally coated bombs because mm-hmm. that's all there were for a while. Uh, Even now, when we're giving stuff to Ukraine, what we're really doing is we're giving them the old stuff and we're building new stuff for ourselves. So that's what's really and a lot of people don't understand that. I've heard yeah. I've heard other people commentate on that. Hey, you have to understand the stuff that the Ukrainians are getting is like 30 years old. Yeah, or the F-16s. If you're going to give F-16s, well, the, the guys who are the Poles that are getting the F-16s, mm-hmm. they're giving Soviet MiG-29s to them or something like that. that you know, the, the, the NATO countries are getting newer fighters and they're yep. training and giving Ukrainian and What's people left? don't understand when you get a new airplane let's say the ukrainians are getting f-16s they're not going to go in the field for a year because they got to train maintenance guys and they got to train pilots and all that's that's what the poles are doing you know yeah. they're all that training's going on in poland there are a lot of air force guys out there doing the training i guarantee yeah. you it just takes a while for and you know you know once he gets f-16s he's going to start bombing russian targets <laughs> He said, I mean, what do you got the F-16s for? They're not going to be defensive. They're going to go out there. Uh, hey, talk a little bit about you were in England for a little while. Uh, yeah. You went to the school and you stayed there and got to talk to a lot of different countries and do some things yeah. there. Talk a little yeah. bit about what that was like being like air attache and, and working with all these other governments. When I when I went there, I checked in at Grosvenor Square. I thought I was, which is where the embassy is, mm-hmm. and that's where my person I checked in with. And one thing was, so I checked in in January. So I had to leave. I had to leave before linebacker two because I had orders to be at Greenwich in January, and I was going to go to have Christmas. So I had to go to Jacksonville, pick up my family, go up to Duxbury, Massachusetts. Christmas to them, go to England with my thousand pounds of travel. <laughs> so, and, yeah. and, and we didn't bother taking anything else because we were in living in quarters and we had to learn how to keep the fire going in the lounge and with <sighs> all that kind of stuff. When I checked in with this guy, he says, oh, you're not going to Greenwich. You're going to Bracknell. And it doesn't start till and if, in what they do in January and February, they take the the Commonwealth countries uh, that were English as a second language, and they teach basically English yeah. in January. So you the first period where everybody's together is in March. So I said, well, what do I do? He says, enjoy two mm-hmm. months. So we literally learned how to, because it wasn't centrally heated. Quarters they had for the Americans, though, had 220 because we had to have refrigerators. The English didn't. They had cold closets. They went, you know, they, oh, it was really amazing. And even, you know, there's two kinds of English officers in the, there's the ones who, who are serving at the pleasure of the queen and take no salary, who are Lord McFadden. And then there's the Scott guy, squadron leader Ross, who they may not be able to afford lettuce that week. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, and it's, you got the, the two kinds. You got anyway the aristocracy that's serving, whose families have served in every war, and and they serve the queen. And then you have the guys who who are the normal everyday guys. It was interesting. So we had like 140 students. 90 of them were Brits, and the rest were foreign countries, and we uh-huh. had Bracknell, uh, an ex-MiG pilot from Afghanistan. We had two Indians. There was a MiG-21 pilot, Jordanian, who was director yeah. of ops in an F-102 squadron in Jordan. He became a very good friend of mine. F-102s, we, wow. We, had, we ended up with the guy that became chief of staff of the Swiss Air Force, Paul Luthold, who was a good friend. Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, Vander Faisal, who was a student. He had a suite of rooms in London, and he had armored minis that drove out to Brackle every day. They didn't live with the us peons. My neighbor across the street, Bruce Jackman, was a Gurkha officer. He learned about the Gurkhas. The and, Gurkhas. Yeah. and he had all kinds of combat experience. Oh, fierce guys, fierce warriors. You know, and he had he had been all, you know, in Africans and 
you know, there's there's little countries. The Gurkhas yeah. are their military. And they're yeah. fighting all kinds of civil wars. He's had experience with that. One of our field trips was in Berlin, and I was at the bar, and some local German guy gave me a was giving harassing me, and that guy was through the freight of the the glass window in the front of the bar in an instant by Jackman, and he was the quiet. <laughs> that guy was something else. Uh, he his, his wife was from Texas, so I learned. That, I mean, we did the purpose of the class. The purpose of the course was social. No question. Yeah. About to establish these tiles. But we, we did have the lecture series. We have some guy talk and some air vice marshal in charge of intelligence. And, and these guys would love to question. They had questions. I asked this Navy captain when I went through, what can I talk about and what can I talk about? They said, don't worry about it. Just talk about whatever you want to talk about. Oh, so I had told them about having an encounter with a Buffalo Hunter drone over North Vietnam. It was just this thing that went flying by me. And I, I told the intelligence guy, this is, I reported this. He said, okay, this is, we are flying this Buffalo Hunter drone. And I actually have a picture of it on my website. <laughs> I'm in England. I'm telling these guys, you know, I said, we strange shit's flying over there. So this guy asks this Air Chief Marshal in charge of intelligence about drones. And they said, well, we're still working on it. And he says, well, that's baloney because we got a Navy guy here who says an American Navy is flying drones over North Vietnam, you know. And, and uh, well, this is 1972. So I enjoyed being able to talk to them about combat, and I really enjoyed yeah. talking to the MiG pilots about yeah. training in Russia, particularly the Indian, who was so smart. Best questions of anybody in that class. I mean, they, you know, and they were all Malaysians and the Indians. Uh, it depended where their caste status was. The guy, we had two people from Malaysia. One of them was from the royal family and he <laughs> could go anywhere. The other guy, Sue, ha had a Chinese wife. So he was doomed. Oh. You know, they hate the Chinese. So he was, he would never be chief of staff, even though he was yeah. bar, far, by far the sharpest. His wife, when we first started out, she was four steps back and three to the side, you know. And at the end of the course, she's working, running around in her husband's shirt. <laughs> you know, I've never seen such a tra transition. So we had all this yeah. social with the families, too. The uh, We had a Persian guy who was the Queen's 130 pilot. Uh, ran. I mean, he it must was, have been it, fascinating to talk it to. It was very interesting talking to all those folks. The Army had a guy from Bulgaria. Bulgarian oh, army. Gary. The Israelis were at the uh, Navy work, the Navy College at Greenwich. But that helped me later. I, you know, I ended up working with General or Admiral Elmog, and Israeli CNO, when I was CEO of a ship and were important. President of the yard was Almog, and he was an Israeli SEAL. Uh, very interesting. So it made you pretty comfortable talking, to, uh, you know, with somebody. But I was uh, talking to the Warriors. I'm. I'm always. I'm not interested in the administration. I didn't care about going to Washington and being a two star. I. I was all about. I enjoyed sh ships and I enjoyed, you know, exercises and doing all that. But uh, I don't care about. We have a group here, in Jacksonville Red Caps, retired captains group. Admirals not allowed. They're all people that are either <laughs> POWs or have two O six commands. So uh -huh. our surface guys are Desrons and. All CAGs, or we have one seal of a carrier. Didn't make admiral, which is very unusual. And we meet twice a month in that group. It is fantastic. And it's all none of it's politics, war fighting stuff, current yeah. stuff. Uh, my buddy Ray, he's staying pretty current. I'm still lolling around in the seventy twos. You know, I did enjoy being able to conduct. You see those the jointness work out um, in 1990, 1990. And I was staying in a hotel with Kuwaitis, and the 135 crews were there. And there were some women in there. And they were all in their bur burkas and stuff. Yeah. And uh, Saudis would come in there. Of course, they had Filipinas doing all the all work. work. And they had Pakistanis were at the front. The men would go in there with the women and children behind. And those women and children would go up to the, up in the hotel. You never see them again. But I had a room off of one of those, <laughs> off there. I was good. I didn't want to be at the 
hotels where all the bre- where the flag officers were. I was pretty happy being amongst the Kuwaitis. <laughs> uh, but we had a dining room for Americans for the 135 crews where I was flying US threes out to the mm-hmm. carriers for Riyadh. I'd fly out to the Red Sea and Persian Gulf and talk to the flag officers about the status of of Desert Storm planning. Of course, we had air wing guys in Riyadh with a cargo uh, vice admiral or Admiral Timmy Wright. He uh-huh. was in Riyadh. My job was a different level from that, but they were doing all the target planning. It was pretty interesting. My first carrier trip, Hayes Gray and underway was on the John F. Kennedy with uh, Riley Mixon's staff in mm-hmm. December of 1990, because I was helping with the planning of all the tanker missions out of Jeddah, which, yeah. of course, as you know, the Saratoga and JFK were sucking off of my tankers big time. I was fortunate to have a roommate who was also a big time into photography, Dave Parsons. He showed me all the great places to take pictures and everything. It was, but you know what? The Air Force knew very, very little about how the Navy strike planning. And that was really, I'm glad we had many, many months for us to be able to talk with that planning staff and figure out how you guys employ. Because once we did it, once the war kicked off, we did it all calm out. But I don't think we could have done that. You know, the Navy attack, of course, Mm -hmm. there's a fighter weapons school. So there's also the light attack wing equivalent. This was back then. This is before yeah. the Super Hornets were taken over. And I say, say somebody deployed to Vietnam in 1972, the West Coast guys all had been to the school. Some of the East Coast guys had, but, but still, yeah. there was a standardization attempt within the Navy by having a fighter weapons yeah. school. It, it, the way we we're organized with air wings, the individual CAGs. Now, at that time, there was a CAG. And he had been a SEAL of a squadron, had been screened for a CAG, and he was a senior commander and one guy. And then the Navy switched and made what was called a super CAG. And there was a deputy CAG and a super CAG. The super CAG was a captain, and he was equivalent to the ops officer of the ship. Then there was the deputy CAG, who basically was the TAC air guy, who would run the F-14s, the A-7s, the A-6s. Ray was a deputy keg with, uh, you know, and then he screened for a senior keg and he couldn't do uh, it for, for, for social reasons. But no matter what the weapons schools had to say, each keg was responsible for his tactics. And, and so there was, there were little differences. There were nuances, air wing to air wing. And that was a big advantage because to me, because mm-hmm. in the West, the North Vietnamese, commanders had no idea what was coming at them. It wasn't quite so in, say, Desert Storm, because Desert Storm was so scripted. You know, there were certain roles for the A-7, and the rules of engagement with the 117s was so interesting. So, And I was there. I got involved in the special ops side, because when I was commanding officer of the Austin, I had SEAL Team 6 on my ship for a while. So I, I kind of had a feel, and we had SEALs embedded in the road from Duran to Kuwait City, SEAL. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the Air Force, and the Army had their guys, guys that got on the airplane with their hand weapons and landed in Saudi Arabia, and they had nothing. The only well-equipped force were the Marines at Duran <laughs> that had light tanks. So the Schwarzkopf wanted to have ch- chieftains. Okay, so we're ready to go to war in September. Yeah. September 16th. I was there for that, like the time, August to se- middle of September. Once the airplane was ready to fly, then of course, then we waited until February to get the chieftains there. But Schwarzkopf wanted, he wanted the tanks in the game, right? He needed the uh, funding to stay in that business. We waited all that time before, but I was there for uh, the first shoot down of a Iraqi airplane. It, it was by Saudi. F-15, but the engagement was from a Marine F-16, uh, F-18 from Sheikh Issa, and they didn't want American to shoot down the Iraqi. It was better to have a, Sa- a Saudi do it. And that's, that uh, was kind of interesting. That all took place up off of, off of Kuwait. That was kind of interesting. And, of course, we did all the 
communications takeout was all seal op and uh that was the seals did some interesting work at that and that stuff and they still do (laughs) that was the fun side of it was putting all that together and watching everybody work together this guy that you know his name the air force guy the the navy or the the marines needed a bunch of strikes or something and the air force had a whole bunch of them so literally the air force gave the marines i mean this was just yeah. them over there nobody was playing polit- there were political yeah. games going on at the general davis level involving AWACS versus navy e2s uh navy e2s can do a good job and and uh general horner the cfac was saying you know well the f-15s have got their ability to uh, you know iff and all that kind of stuff you know and which kind of rubbed the f-14 guys raw you know because i've talked to a lot of them but the 14 at that time period you know had some great great capabilities too hey, the f-14 could see the 117s yeah the, the burn I, through for a 117 was was the, the 117s could be seen in the f-14 at like 40 miles i didn't so, know that didn't now know of that. course the rules of engagement didn't allow the f-14s to shoot at anybody yeah. until the 117s were out of it then it yeah. was anything fine you could shoot at great great roe but yeah. nobody nobody could uh shoot and i think those f-14s that looked at them were sneaking the peak i don't know if they were supposed to turn their their radars on but good I, good the and F-14. of course you had the phoenix missile too which had that long range on the on the phoenix you know you know so, throw that sucker out there, there 90 miles of, there was a lot of good stuff the working at the flag level, the, the one star and below level, it's pretty good. And then yeah. once you get to three stars, then there's a lot of politics. But And that was, hasn't changed. <laughs> you know, and, you know, air control, whatever. Now, Ray, he was in insular Turkey, and he was deconflicting long-range missiles um, uh-huh. going into a uh, uh-huh. but, but there were still lessons, I felt, lessons learned the compartmentalization compartmentalization Um, issue is something that i have a couple of references in there about losing pilots and having to fly the next day having to be able to do that uh some comments about flying the flight schedule politics are meaningless i mean uh, nobody ever ever thought about the i mean people complained about you know things like not being able to hit SAM sites that are have missiles on there, but they flew the mission. I don't know anybody other than Ted Tobin who who attacked the wrong ship, the incorrect ship. But we just flew the schedule. It, that I was a department head. I was a maintenance officer in the squadron, and Snuffy Smith, my roommate, was the ops officer. We had those jobs the, the crews before, and normally we would have swapped them, and I would have become the ops officer. He would have been. But we had our, we were well organized, and we know we we pretty much took the same pilots to the second cruise, not all but some, and we didn't want to. We were busy enough just planning strikes and flying them. We really didn't have time mm-hmm. to do the main. I didn't have time to do the maintenance. Fortunately, well, the other thing you may find of interest, we took stations three and six off of the airplane without asking anybody. That was quite a chore. We did that. We came. We went around Cape yeah. Town, and we came back. And we took three and six off because we had the TF thirty P four hundred eight engine, and the center of gravity was such that we could only carry a five hundred pound bomb on the on that inboard station, and that meant that station was forty knots of indicated airspeed. Really, I take it off. It was a much wow. clear, much cleaner airplane without that without those stations on there. And I, I have a picture of the clean of an A7C without three and six. And so we'd have those MERS out there, and then we'd have a strike or something on the outboard station. Yeah. We had nothing between the MER and the, si- yeah. and the side of the airplane. It was much cleaner. And yeah. you just put a, a one bomb on there, it wasn't worth it. So, and we could carry a Sidewinder. We didn't. I didn't yeah, on the fuselage. Yeah, I remember we seeing We could have carried a Sidewinder. We had a fuselage position for it. We didn't ever train it. Uh, and you talk about the Phoenix, you know, the F-8 had the sparrows. They never carried them. They, they were sidewinders and guns. Of course, unfortunately, the F-4 didn't have a gun, so mm-hmm. they couldn't fire, which was just ridiculous, not having guns in a fighter. 
Yeah. And and that's what everybody says too. Like the F eight was the last gunfighting jet that the yeah. Navy had until you know the F fourteen came around and had M sixty one Vulcan M-61. cannon too. You know, what a great gun. Oh, yeah. it is. You know, it's still being used today for crying out loud. You know, sure. Yeah, it's a good so, gun. Well, the C was just kind of like it. You know, on the explosive uh, weapon system. Oh, that is one of the most unique sounds I've ever heard. Yeah. Other than maybe the A ten gun is the sound of the sea whiz. And I remember being on a carrier once where they were testing it, you know, yeah. and they were training crews on the yeah. sea whiz. Yeah. And you just hear that. Well, the destroyers in, off of Yemen are actually shooting drones down with Yeah. Them. And yeah. They are, they've been shooting down rockets and everything in land with those things too. So, I mean, just crazy stuff. So, You know, I learned about if you're in the military for a mm-hmm. career and you're deciding what you want to do, you know, there's warriors out there and there's not. We have a problem. We first get into a war, we find we have a lot of politicians out there in the in the key mm-hmm. war fighting, and it takes a while to get the war fighters up there to those decision making positions. Fortunately in Vietnam we had you know, the president of the United States deciding what targets to do on Tuesdays at lunch. So oh I do talk a little bit about about the politics, we, and people don't realize how good Nixon was. And his under, like when somebody like Kissinger says in the White House years, you know, he's never, no president of the United States ever had a feeling for the international. And Nixon's ability to pit China and Russia against each other at the end of the Vietnam War. Was genius. Incredible how that was going on. And there were things going on. Like in 71, I point this out in the memoir too. We're in 71 doing a med cruise, but Nixon is working the Chinese. And uh-huh. then he actually has a Chinese trip while we're up. So in oh, one, yeah. one of our bombing hauses, pauses was, you know, was due to that trip. And you say, well, it ends up working pretty well. Uh-huh. Uh, but anyway, I, I am very fortunate because I was able to be a Navy carrier pilot in the Vietnam uh-huh. era. Where Formation flying was important and it was fun all the way through. When I see a squadron, we never came back without doing diamond formation acrobatics. It's important for the yeah. idea that Blue Angels are just F 18 pilots from squadrons. I mean, they're not going to pick the worst people, but no. they, could, they, could, they could pick probably two or three out of any squadron. And I'm anxious to see how the female number two does. Um, you know, the Thunderbirds. Yeah. I've flown with a bunch of women in Navy A4s. Let me tell you, they are, they're they good pilots. The ones that I've met, I, damn good. I've flown with a lot of them. I uh, I interviewed a gal who flew with the Thunderbirds. They've had uh, several females, several gals flying with the Thunderbirds. No big deal. Yeah. You know, they just, they're just think, as good as I think else. their ergonomics for women, the way the, I think women have a better g tolerance than men do anyway there's some truth that yeah. well i don't think any questions pop up out of this where we go from here from the you know, you know what and, and like i said we've been going for two hours and 15 minutes brother yeah. and uh i'm not going to keep you any longer bo this has been fantastic though well i hope so i've learned so much things in the vietnam war that i'd never heard of before like tossing yeah. a mark 20 rock eye i'd never heard that before yeah. having you explain iron hand and Again, great lessons learned from relationships. People that you knew in the Vietnam War, you know, Snuffy Smith, and look where he ends up. Just a fantastic stuff. And compartmentalization. Boy, isn't that the truth, man? You know, you just put all that stuff out of your head. But you know that that has, I talk a little about, I call, I call it a type of PTSD that's called emotional numbness. And, and I don't feel, when people die, I, uh, I feel grief. I felt grief when my my dog died. Yeah. But people, I just kind of okay. I just kind of go with it, and yeah. I, can, I can operate yeah. through it. And I'm not going to get hysterical about it. Yeah. And I'm so I'm. I can make decisions through yeah. stress. And you learn that in a you know Miller Dietrich, who was one of the ten, says, yeah. "What do you do in a four when you have a problem? You wind the ten day clock." You put your elbows on the canopy rail and you just take a few breaths because you don't want to screw up the first mm-hmm. maneuver. You, know, you just learn how to do it. So when things get bad, you find that people who are in the military 
are run, going to run into the to the fire and out of it. And I just think that's a lesson learned. I don't know that it's a good one in the civilian world, but at least you can make decisions. But there certainly is a warrior class as opposed to a political class in the military. Of course, in peacetime, the the middle the political guys <laughs> seem to. You know, I I watch. They're going to give Putin. Oh, cluster bombs are uh, a, a war crime now. Give me a break. Yeah. Cluster bombs are the way to go. For certain missions, certain targets, you better believe. Yeah. CBU is the way to Ukrainians are using them as appropriate. You know, wow. yeah, just this idea of like after World War One, they decided it was a bad idea to have submarines. <laughs> not, a, not a good move. Mm-hmm. But anyway, I learned a lot. So I'm, I'm enjoying not, and that's just observing, but in my group, my my monthly Association of Naval Aviation lunch, but the Red Caps group, to getting to talk to the surf, surface guys. And one of the guys in our group, he's, he now passed away recently at 102, oh, was geez. in the first submarine in the Battle of Lady Gulf. So, and to be able to talk to those kind of people, just amazing. Just, just And brother, that's why I had you on, being able to talk to you. Because yeah. we've heard incredible stories today. And so I yeah. appreciate you coming on. Okay. Okay. Well, I enjoyed it. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. I really enjoyed spending time with Bo Smith on this show. I'm trying to get in contact with a lot more Vietnam vets. They have incredible stories. Next week's show is with John D. Markle, a MIG killer from the Vietnam War during the 1972 linebacker campaign, flying in the famous oyster flight on the 10th of May. There was a lot of MIGs up that day, a lot of MIG kills that day. And uh, he tells a really interesting story about about that. Just interviewed Chuck de Bellevue, the highest scoring ace with six kills of the Vietnam War. He's going to be on in a couple weeks. I'm doing all the editing for those shows now. Wait till you hear these stories. I mean, they're just fantastic. As always, the Lessons from the Cockpit show is brought to you and is financially supported by Wall Pilot custom aviation art for the walls of your home office or hangar. Please folks go by and take a look at these. These are really exhaustively researched profile prints four, six and eight feet on vinyl that you can peel off and stick to any surface. We're pretty sure that they're waterproof. Not that you'd put a four footer on your truck, but all of the patches that we've done, many people have put on their vehicles. There's 143 ready to print profile views that you can go to at wallpilot.com. They start at a four footer at 99, an eight footer is 159. If there's a favorite airplane that you want with your name on it, tail number and a custom weapons load on it, we can do that for you and you can fill out a form on wallpilot.com and uh, we can start on that. These are very exhaustively researched, like I said. They're stenciling on the missiles, on the aircraft. I appreciate you going by and taking a look at wallpilot.com. Thanks once again, folks, for being with us today. It was great to have Bo Smith on. We're going to do Vietnam Vets and we've got a gentleman who runs an FBO at Portsmouth, New Hampshire, Port City Air, who is also going to be on in a few weeks. Thanks for downloading these. You can find all of these on the website at uh, lessonsfromthecockpit.show. And we'll talk to you again next week.